Good morning. Welcome back to Engineering 11. We're talking more about MATLAB. Can you believe that we're already in week five? I believe this is class nine. Can someone confirm me on that? I know for sure it's Monday the 3rd of 2020. I think this is week five. And if this is week five, that means this is uh, class number nine. Today we're working through um, more information about signed integers, storing and manipulating integers. Any updates on that if this is indeed class number nine? I believe it's five. Yeah, let's go ahead and check. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Confirm that. Uh, we're pretty much staying consistent with the lecture part of the class. Um, we're here, we're gonna spend two days going over this material. Uh, we are gonna update later today, I'm gonna to outsource all questions about the lab until the actual lab meeting. So if you have questions, which I'm sure you do, uh, please save those for later today. We'll have a long discussion, detailed discussion. You probably saw that I sent you some updates on that assignment. Um, we will renegotiate both the exam and the lab due date, so that's gonna come later today. Are there any questions that you feel you need to have answered before we go on? Besides la lab questions, obviously, like content from last week or concerns that you had. As your questions arise, please let me know how I can serve you. Uh, YouTube, anybody checking to make sure that this is? Yeah, awesome, and the, the sound is working and the mic's okay and all that stuff? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Let's do a quick recall. So let's do a recall of lesson three. What were the main themes that we surfaced in lesson three? What were the main ideas that we studied? Yeah, Michelle says unsigned integers. How many different representations did we study for unsigned integers? Yeah. Yep, so let y be an element of the non-negative natural numbers. Another way to say that is the non-negative integers. And then let's recall, we have three equivalent representations. The one we were used to, yep, we had this idea of decimal, so we said this is an n plus one decimal digit representation. We said that each decimal digit came from the set of all possible decimal digits. So if we looked at each decimal digit, we could choose any number between zero and one less than the radix, right? For giggles, we also said to ourselves, anytime we're gonna think about a number in base 10 representation, we can put parentheses and a subscript 10 and that meant that each of these things was scaled by the corresponding radix. If we were thinking about doing the actual conversion to uh, decimal representation, do you remember how we did that? Sum from i equals zero to capital N, each decimal digit correlates with the corresponding power of 10. So the index on each digit is identical to the position number, which is identical to the base 10, right? Um, and we call this radex 10 representation. What was the next one we worked on? Yeah, so this was called a decimal representation.
Um, and then I suppose, let's go ahead and write this. Um, so this is Monday, I cannot believe that happened so quickly. 2, 3, 2020. And it looks like I did a decent job of starting on time today. Call this page two, call this page one. We had what was known as a binary representation. All right, and in this case we said y was equal to b sub m, b sub m minus one, b1, b0. What did we say about each binary digit? What are the different choices of values for each binary digit? Yeah, and I think one of you, I forget if it was James or perhaps Tree, could have been Michelle too, I, my mind is a little bit foggy at the moment, uh, suggested that we use the set B. where this set represented the individual values. The pattern holds though, right? Each time we have a digit in a base representation, the first value of the digit that's possible is zero, and then we go all the way up through one less than the radix, right? So in, in base 10, zero through 10 minus one. In base two, zero through two minus one. The corresponding value of y, if we were to try to represent this as a decimal, representation, we scale each binary digit by the yep, associated power of the radix 2. So the index of each binary digit matches the power. And then we had one more representation. What was our third representation? Yeah, we had this thing called a hexadecimal representation. And we did a little bit less work here, but I think it's important to remind ourselves. And we'll do some data class analysis in just a second. We're just doing our review. Hexadecimal, do you remember the symbols that we used for that? H sub L, H sub L minus one, all the way down through H1, H0. And what did we say about each single hexadecimal digit? Well, if we call decimal digits in the set D, we call binary set digits in the set B, what might we say about hexadecimal, hexadecimal digits? H. And then what do we claim about the set H? Yeah, so it goes 0 all the way to 9, A all the way to F, where A represents the number 10, B represents the number 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 is F, and then we start over at the number 0 for our next representation. And the corresponding base 10 sum and Someone give me that one. I goes from 1 to L of H sub I times 16 to the I. I have not written this in your lab three, but I'm highly excited about this problem. Find the relationship between, any guesses what I'm about to say? How many decimal, uh, decimal digits are required to encode m plus one binary digits, vice versa? Same question between decimal and hexadecimal, same question between hexadecimal and binary, right? So I'll, I'm going to leave that. I actually, on Saturday, I went for a run. And for the first three miles, I was working that problem out in my head. Um, I, don't, I don't think I actually need three miles, because I think this is gonna, there's going to be a logarithmic thing here. 
but I was trying to work out how I was going to test you on it. <laughs> so we'll, we'll come back to that problem in a bit. Um, what I want to do is actually start talking now about our different data classes and then extend our understanding of how what MATLAB is doing in the background. I might ask for your help in this situation. What are the names of the four unsigned integer data classes that MATLAB uses? Yep. So it's part of the how many data classes, native data classes, does MATLAB provide as of today? MATLAB provides, so I guess we'll say, provides exactly How many data classes did MATLAB provide? 16. 16. And then it provides 10 numerical data classes, four of which are what we call unsigned integers. And the way that I like to think about unsigned integers is it starts with a u and then int. So let's go ahead and look at that. The first one is u int 8. What's the next one? Yep. U int 16, U int 32, and then also U int 64. Let's go ahead and think about this. If it's U int 8, how many binary digits would a U int 8 variable store? What is M? Try again. I agree with you that it stores eight binary digits, but that must be an m plus one digit representation. So eight equals m plus one, which means m equals. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> must be like this, right? M plus one equals eight, which means m equals. Seven, yeah, yeah, right. That's okay. I thought you were. You're making sure I'm awake, right? Yeah, yeah, I know it. Okay, so there's there's eight total digits. What about this one? Where would this one start? Yep. Fourteen. Yeah, you're exactly correct. B one, B zero. What about this one? Yep. all the way down to B1 and then B0 and then U int 64, 63, 62. And we talked about last time what the range on this sucker would be, right? 4 and M plus 1 bit representation. In this case, we'd say BM, BM minus 1, all the way down to B1, B0. What is the absolute upper bound for the value of this representation? When does overflow happen? So 2 to some power. This is not a strict inequality. It's a lenient inequality. What's the largest possible value that can be achieved there? This thing minus 1. What's the smallest value that could be achieved with an m plus 1 bit representation? 0. 
We'll come back to that. And in fact, why don't we write just a little code? So let's check our work here. Let's try to max out um, u int 16. So I would like to get a binary representation that is the largest one that I can do accurately in that data class. So if 16 is the number of bits, what is M? 15. So we would say 2 to the 16 minus 1. And then one of the things that we can do here is we can actually do, a f we can do a few things actually. So we can format hex. Now if I go ahead and look at what answer is, what does this hexadecimal representation tell me? So let's go back to pen and paper analysis to really understand what's happened here. There it is. So we just wrote this, the line of code. So we have the following line of code. We set m uh, y equal to u int 16 of 2 to the 16 minus 1. In this case, we're going to call this thing an m plus 1 bit representation. But how many bits are used? which implies m plus 1 equals how many bits? 16, which implies m is equal to 16 minus 1. It must be 15 because today is Monday, right? Which means that this thing right here is actually b to the 15, b to the 14, uh, excuse me, b sub 14, b1, b0. But we talked about earlier that um, the Tower of Hanoi problem tells us that in order to get 2 to the 16 minus 1, th what does that mean about each individual bit in that string? One. Must be 1. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to group bits by nibbles. If I have 16 bits, and each nibble is four bits, how many nibbles do I have? Yeah. So that is equivalent in our representation, something that looks like that. We also had this concept that in hexadecimal, what did we say about each group of four ones? Represents the letter F, F because this thing is 15, right? It's 1 below 16. Another way to say that is that F is 1 times 2 to the 3 plus 1 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 to the 1 plus 1 times 2 to the 0, which another way to say that is that F is equal to 2 to the 4 minus 1. That is exactly what MATLAB is saying here. The bit string stored in this hexadecimal number is this one. Let's go ahead and break this data class. What do I mean break the data class? Yeah, so if I said u in 16 of 2 to the 16, So strictly speaking, if I take 2 to the, so let's do this. 
A equals 2 to the 16. B, oh, sorry, format long. B equals A minus 1. What do you say about A minus B? Should be 1, right? But if I encode those classes, we talked about this last time, in this data representation, what happens? Right? So the next question is, well, what is going on when we do addition and subtraction under this? So what format hex does is it gives us a representation of the bit string used to store this data. One of the immediate questions we might ask ourselves is now that we know how it's stored, how do we manipulate it? All right, well, let me go back to arithmetic. Once we knew how to count, what was the next thing that we learned? How to add. Could you guess what are the, one of the very, very natural questions that arises when we're talking about storing and manipulating binary numbers? How do you add binary numbers? Yeah. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. This is 2-3-2020. Suppose this is going to be 10-23. All right. All right, so we're going to do two things here. We're going to do binary, and we're also going to do decimal. Could you guess which one we start with? Which one do we know really well? Decimal. So let's think about this for a second. In decimal, what is 0 plus 0? Zero? 0. So this is a decimal representation. What is the corresponding binary realization of that decimal representation? Yeah, that one's really nice, right? 0 plus 0 is equal to 0. And then at some point, we're going to need some notation. There's formal names for this, and I don't remember that at this exact moment. So if I have like an addition, I don't know if you all have seen the formal names for the, the operator or the operand on the left of the addition and the operand on the right of the addition. They're in Latin. No? Nobody? OK. I've seen them before, and I don't remember them. I probably wrote them up, to be honest with you. Um, so we'll call this the addition operator. And then we'll call this the left operand. And for those of you that recognize that this is indeed actually a binary operation, what do I mean binary? How many operands do I expect? Yeah, could you guess what a trinary operator is? Three operands, right? OK, so we have a left operand. Could you guess what this one's called? Right the right operand. And if you were reading from left to right, you might also call that the second operand. Okay, so the question that I have for you is, which of these would you like to be our first operand and which of them would you like to be our second operand? Do you want the one on top to be the first or the second? First, okay, so I, I'm going to go with John because I heard his voice first. We'll call this the first operand. And then if we call that the first operand, we might call this thing the second operand. Do you know what the output of a sum is called? The sum. <laughs> yeah, you are right, though, that you could also call these summands. So this is the left summand, and that's the right summand. So I suppose that we're going to just get fancy now, right? So summands are things that you put into sums. 
the output is called the sum. All right. So let me let's take a look at the next simplest case. What are all the different choices of binary that we have? Each digit could be either 0 or 1. So if I add two binary digits, how many total choices do I have? Two for each of them, right? So either the first one can be 0 and the second can be 1. Maybe we'll start, I don't know, do you want to set the first one to 1 first or the first one to 0 first? 1, okay, so we go 1, 0. Let's go real slow here. What is the corresponding decimal realization of this problem? Yeah, this is 1 plus 0. What is 1 plus 0 in decimal? 1. What is 1 plus 0 in binary? 1. OK, could you guess what we do next? Well, let's see. So far, we've tested the 0 for the first operand, 1 for the first operand, but both cases had 0 for the second operand. Can you guess if we're going to get the entire spectrum what we might do next? A little too fast for old Anderson. Yeah, so we would do 0 plus 1. What do you say about 0 plus 1 in decimal and binary? 1. So again, notice that this, in this representation, we need exactly the same number of bits for both of these problems as we do digits, right? Decimal digits. Anybody venture to guess when things change? Yeah, the problem we haven't finished yet, right? My claim, though, is that if we understand this set of problems, we actually understand almost anything that we'll ever need to understand about unsigned decimal representations. And my next claim is, if we understand what's happening in unsigned decimal representations, we can very quickly get a deep understanding of what signed, decimal, uh, signed representations are done with. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. 1 plus 1. Well, answer that question for me in decimal. What is 1 plus 1 in decimal? 2. What is 2 in binary? 1, 0. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. The second parentheses becomes a 2. All right, so check this out. Um, I guess I would actually need. Uh, this is kind of interesting, right? Because I've got one bit plus another bit becomes a two-bit number, right? So, and the thing that I'll say is if when I have one plus one, we're going to have something called a, uh, I always forget, sum in a carry. So 1 plus 1 becomes 1, 0. So this thing right here, we're going to call the carry bit. And then this thing right here, we're going to call the sum bit. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the fun thing. I, I mean, uh, one of the dreams that I have in this class for the long term in terms of teaching my students what's actually going on underneath is, act is to build transistor gates to show you how this is actually implemented electronically so that when you actually see a plus, you understand what's happening at a hardware level, right? Um, we can actually, I'm not going to go into that this quarter because I've chosen not to do 300 hours of writing because I actually had to work last quarter. So last year, one of the reasons that I wrote the 200 pages that you saw is because my son was born in September. And so I got to write for about five months before I started this class. I did not have the same privilege this year, right? I taught in fall quarter this year, so I, I haven't got to update this yet. But you're exactly correct to say that underneath all of this is uh, a set of logic constraints, right? So one of the things that's really interesting about this is um, this concept now underlies 
every single binary addition that we could hope for. So what I want to do next, actually, I'd like to take a look at a much harder problem. And this one I'm actually going to align with the notes. Instead of having you look at your notes, we're going to do this together. So we'll start with decimal representation because you all are old pros at this. Um, and this is going to be example 4.1. And I'd like to add 139 to 91. And this is decimal addition. <laughs> right. So what would that look like in decimal addition? Yeah, uh, go real slow for me. Don't give me the output. Tell me how you do it in terms of the by, bit by, or digit by digit representation there. Okay, 9 plus 1, we have what we call the sum digit, and then we have what we call the carry digit. So this is the sum in position 0. And this thing right there, we might call the carry digit from position 0 sum. OK, so now what, what do we do? Yeah, so actually we have three things that we're adding here. 3 plus 9 is 12 plus 1 is 13. What would we call the 3 there? Yeah, this is going to be the sum in position 1. What do we notice about those two things? This two, this sum of single decimal digits produced a double decimal digit representation whose value in position 1 was equal to 1. Could you guess what we call that thing? Yeah, we call this the carry in, I guess, from position 1 sum. In this case, when there's not a written digit, what value does it have? Zero. zero. And then we would say 1 plus 1 plus 0 is 2. So the total sum of that number would look something like this. OK. So now the question is, well, what is the corresponding value of this thing when we go to decim uh, binary? Um, and then there's a few ways to do this. How many of you would like to figure this out off the top of your head? How might you do it really quickly without having a actually to, to do that work for yourself? So let's see. Is that in decimal or is it in binary? 139. So literally, I can now capture that, right? Looks like 130 is 1. Zero, 011, one, one, right? 1, 2, 3. 1011. One, one. Next, we could actually do desk to bin. 91, and then I would probably reverse engineer this thing. 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Can someone check me that the problem that I'm writing is indeed the same problem? Well, let's go ahead and take a look here. Let's do position number. So this is going to be what we call binary addition. And then we can check the positions, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 2 to the 7th is probably something like 128 plus 8 
is 136 plus 2 is 138 plus 1 is 139, right? Okay. If this is 2 to the 6, that must be 64 plus 16 would be something like 80, 88, 90, 91. Okay. Let's go ahead and start adding. 1 plus 1. The sum is a 0. The carry is a 1. 1 plus 1 plus 1. Well, let's see. 1 plus 1 is 10. 10 plus 1 is 11. So now I have a value of 1 in the sum and 1 in the carry. 1 plus 0 plus 0. One carry zero. Okay, let's see. Zero plus one plus one. Zero in the sum, one in the carry. One plus zero plus one. Zero one. One plus zero plus zero. One zero in the carry. 0 plus 0 plus 1. 1, 0 in the carry. If a bit is not apparent in the way that I write it in on paper, what value does that bit have? 0. So now I have something that looks like 0 plus 1 plus 0 is 1. And I need no value in the carry bit there, right? OK. So let's go ahead and check this. Here's position 0, position 1, position 2, position 3, position 4, position 5, position 6, position 7, position 8. Looks like I'm going to have 128 plus 64. 128 plus 64 is going to be like 192. And then plus 32, 19 plus 3 would be like 22. 4 plus 2 is, so like 126, right? 130. Uh, oh sugar, I'm a little tired right now. Let's try it again. 128 plus 64. Yeah, 192, there it is. And then I've got one, uh, 224, 228, 230. There it is, right? So this thing now becomes the value of that representation, which means in every single time that I add, what's the claim of that addition? For each two bits that I add, I need to have what I call a sum bit and also a carry bit, right? So when adding, let's go ahead and make a conjecture. So if I add 2m plus 1 bit unsigned binary integers, so let's call them bm, bm minus 1, b1, b0, we'll do binary addition on those things. And we'll call this one, I don't know, beta m beta m minus 1 all the way down to beta 1, beta 0. And if we call this sum y, what possibilities do we have for the output? If we're going to accurately store the output, what number of bits would we have? So for each binary digit, we have what we have a sum and uh, carry. But what does that mean about the last one? So like, let's pretend for a moment that this was 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 
and this one was one 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 one. Yeah, then the sum could possibly have a m plus two bit representation. Right? Which means if I'm capturing data in a data class, when might overflow happen? Yeah, so let's take a look at this one. And I'm going to have you do this one for yourselves because. So I'd like you to do this. I'd like you to add 215 plus 88. The first question that I have is, given the size of the sumams, what might be the smallest representation? Before you know about addition, if you just looked at each sumand individually, what data class might you choose to use? Yeah, so we might say uint8 would be a really nice data class here, right? Because what's the largest number that uint8 would allow you to capture? 255, right? Okay, so this one surely could get a 255. Uh, it's below 255. This one surely is below 255. So now I'm going to ask you, go ahead for yourself and carry out this binary addition as we did above. by hand. So I will do that with you, but I'd like you to figure out how to do those individually. And you can either convert these numbers to binary by hand, or you can convert these numbers to binary using MATLAB. I don't care what you do, right? Oh, I think it looks like I, I wrote the wrong. Looks like the example that I wrote is different than the statement of the problem that I put. So let's go ahead and do it something like that. Let's see, 89. So this would be 64. So 
64, 32, 16, for sure, right? 6, and 1. All right, raise your hand if you finish that. Raise your hand if you're still working. All right. Um, I want to show this because this, this gets into one of the major hypotheses that I've made as a coder, which is the type of data class we use to encode data greatly affects the type of output that we get once we've chosen that. So in particular, if I were to do this, if I were to say that, I don't know, x equal uint 8, of 2, 1, 5, and then I said that y is equal to u int 8, in this case of 89, so let's go ahead and do this. My question is, what happens when I do the addition in MATLAB? Because many of you might believe before, I mean, if you're taking a computer architecture, you're kind of familiar with this, but that's not a prerequisite for this class. So I'm going to treat it as if you're not taking that class. So the first thing that I'll ask, let's go ahead and write a script. Uh, Art and I are working on, and maybe some of you will do this as well. Um, the reason I'm going to write a script is that I want to see this again. So let's go ahead and say that x is equal to u int 8 of uh, 215 and then we'll let y be equal to u int 8 of um, 89 and what we can do is we can format hex um, and then why don't we run this thing and I'll go ahead and dock this sucker. So let me go back to this thing. I guess this is going to be um, class 9. So let's go ahead and do new folder 2020-02-03. This is a Monday, and this is going to be class number 9. Open that sucker. And we're going to do um, unsigned... integer experiment. Okay, so let's uh, just forget how to minimize. Oh, it's up here, right? Doc editor. Okay, let's go ahead and save this and run. Uh, let's change folder. Okay. So what did MATLAB just tell me? I just got some information from MATLAB. What did it tell me? So what is D? Well, if F is 15, D must be 13. D must be 2 before F, right? 
So, and then seven is seven, right? So if I go back to the representation, I now know that the number 215 in two hexadecimal digits is D7. I know D is 13. Well, what is 13? 13 be, must be 8 plus 4 plus 1, right? 7 must be 4 plus 3 plus, excuse me, 4 plus 2 plus 1, which means that this number is that number, right? All right, 5, 9. Well, what is 5? 5 is 4 plus 1, right? So 5 is 4 plus 1. What is 9? 9 is 8 plus 1, right? OK. If I were to set z equal to x plus y, and we were in a world that made sense, what should x plus y produce? Three oh four, right? So for sure, if we were in a world that made sense, if this was a mathematical addition, this should be three oh four, no questions asked, right? And then the question was, well, what is three oh four in terms of a binary representation? Yeah, I mean, one way to do this is just to avoid the, the issue of having to do math by your, by, in your head, right? So if you just do des2 bin 304, that's a simple way to do it. But one of the best ways to learn is actually to test yourself. What's the biggest power of 2 before 304? Looks like 256. What's the difference between 256 and 304? 48, well, what is 48? 48 must be 32 plus 16, right? So I have 256, no 128s, no 64s, for sure a 32, for thorough 16, no 8s, no 4s, no 2s, no zeros. Uh, sorry, you, you couldn't see that, right? So that's 256 plus 32 plus 16. Let's go ahead and check. And then I always like to group these by fours. So my first nibble is four zeros. And then I have something that looks like a one, one, zero, zero. And then I have this hanging one around, right? In hexadecimal, so this is my binary representation. What do you think that is in hexadecimal? Depends on how many hexadecimal digits I'm allowed, right? We'll come back to that in a bit. But again, notice that I'm not using MATLAB first. I'm using my brain first, and then MATLAB confirms what my brain has to say, right? OK, so four, yep, look at that. One, two, three, four zeros. 16, I have one of them. 32s, I have one of them. 0, 064, 0s, 128s here, right? So let's go ahead and test for a second. Z equals X plus Y. What happened? MATLAB is telling me that 215 plus 89 is 255. Whose fault is that? Because I made the choice about how I encode data, right? So in particular, what am I noticing if I choose two summands who individually get stored in the data class, but whose output doesn't? Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could try that, right? I guess you could try this thing where you say, like, so check this out. You could try, like, z equals u int 16 of x plus y. <laughs> what happened? 
So let's go ahead and go out of hex. So what is MATLAB telling me the value of Z is? So what she told me is, hey, Jeff, you should try to cast Z with a larger data class because we know that we're going to need more than 8 bits to encode that, right? The problem, though, you, many of you might think addition is addition is addition is addition, right? If you add, the output of the addition should be legit, right? What's the problem in this case? Encoded into this addition without ever thinking about it as a user is what? That's an 8-bit addition. It's the same freaking symbol. It's not like I'm changing the symbol, right? But the fact of the matter is, when I have, how many bits have I encoded X in? 8. How many bits have I encoded Y in? 8. So MATLAB reads that, and then it says, hey, X is an 8-bit, Y is an 8-bit, so then the sum I'm going to store as an 8-bit. And in fact, check this out. We might say to ourselves, well, why don't I try this? Oh, sugar. What did we just learn? <laughs> A single addition symbol, which is syntax, right, requires what? Whatever data class the left sum end is cast in, the right sum end must match that, right? So a few things are happening here. Number one, we've just got our sense of what overflow is. See if you can put into a single sentence what overflow means. And we'll take a break right after this. What is overflow? Not everybody at once, please. Not funny. That's not funny, Anderson. Shut up. It's, it's week five. We're tired. Zero fun in math class, please. I wish I could capture exactly what you just said. Overflow happens when we try to store a number in a data class that does not allocate enough memory to accurately capture our desired number. So a great example of this, if I set z equal to u, u int 8 of 304, the number that actually gets stored if we think about this as an assignment and not an equal sign, what is MATLAB assignment? What does MATLAB do when you hit it with that assignment operator? Stores it as the number two fifty five. As coders, if we want to guard against overflow. we can extend our range 
recast operands in a quote unquote larger or more appropriate data class. In this case, how would we guard against? We can't cast after the fact, right? The casting have to, has to happen before the fa fact. So if I really wanted to capture Z, what could I do to guard against this problem? UN16 of 215 plus UN16 of 89. And then the claim is that the output will indeed get 304 in base 10, which we just said in hexadecimal was going to be 1030. Uh, zero, zero. Let's go ahead and write that out in hexadecimal. Oh yeah, so we will get to a place, I, I agree with you that um, as time goes on, we, we can avoid all of this, right? But the issue though is that you all don't know every single time, so this is really interesting. Um, let's, let's come back to that in just a second. In fact, we'll do a numerical experiment, take a break, and then come back and talk about this. But before we do that, let me ask you this. So here's my claim. In hexadecimal, what does zero represent? A nibble, in this case we're going to call a nibble four bits. What is one? Zero, 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 one. What is three? And then we've got zero, 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 zero. So let's go ahead and check to see if that is indeed legit always using MATLAB as a secondary source after our brain until we're confirming that MATLAB is not full of malarkey. So let's go ahead and say uint 16 of 2, oh, sorry, I broke my own rule there, of 215 plus uint 16 of 89. What does MATLAB claim the output is? Is that the actual value of the output? What is it? I want to show you something crazy. So I'm going to do something that looks like this. What do you expect? 304, right? You would expect that this produces the same output as this, right? Let's go ahead and check. Are those the same output? One of these formats, so claim, the interpreted value of this output is identical, right? What's the interpreted value of the first one? 304. What's the interpreted value of the second one? 304. But when would you say that the two outputs are identical from the standpoint of a computer language? What's going to happen when I subtract one from the other? You all are claiming that they're the same output, right? What the hell is going on here? 
This is not about syntax. So when we come back from break, we'll talk about one, why are we studying unsigned integers? What's the connection between unsigned integer addition and um, overflow and range extension? And then what happens when we start wanting to encode um, what we might call um, signed integers? What are the problems that arise when you want to add negatives, right? What are you noticing? Syntax is this problem, right? A plus sign is a plus sign is a plus sign is a plus sign. Is it? Yeah. And this is one of the reasons that I want you to know this. Again, this is not like, if you were interested in learning syntax, get really, really familiar with what's going on with MATLAB's documentation. There's a lot of great technical um, demonstrations of how you use MATLAB syntax. But underneath that syntax is what you might call the inner workings. And what we're doing in this class, I'm going to repeat it over and over and over again so you understand what my, my pedagogy is, we're opening the hood and starting to disassemble the individual parts, which is the engine of MATLAB. That goes into the reading that we'll talk about in Lab 3. Let's take a break right now. It's 11.08. What time are we going to be back? 11.18, we'll get started, and then we'll finish up our introduction to signed integer representations.